If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, we're going to be in three passages today. We'll be in Isaiah 9, we'll be in Isaiah 53, and then we'll be in Luke 15. And so, these passages, I have a, a lot that I, I want to run through, but I want us to think about this idea of home for the holidays. Last week, we talked in uh, the Gospel of John, we saw John chapter 3, Jesus and Nicodemus, their interaction, and, and what he was saying to Nicodemus was, you have to be born again, you have to be born new to come into the kingdom. And we asked the question, well, why would God do that? And the answer comes in John 3.16, because he loves humanity. He has such a love for his creation, for us who have fallen, that he sent the Son to redeem. And so we looked at that last week, and so this week we're going to go through a little bit of what is it that the Son is going to do. And so we'll start with the promise in Isaiah 9, and we'll talk a little bit about why we get to this promise, and then we'll go through uh, Isaiah 53 and see what it is that the Messiah to come, what this babe was coming for, what he was to do. And then we'll jump to the New Testament, and we'll see this parable that Jesus tells uh, about the prodigal son, about then what is it that the Father is doing with us? How does this all work together? And so that's where we're going. So if you will, uh, hopefully you're at Isaiah 9. Uh, let's pray together and we'll, we'll get started. Well, Father, we thank you. Thank you for just this moment where we can look in your word that you have given us this revelation of yourself and you've, and you've given us these promises that we can see them and they took place hundreds of years before Jesus even came and they point to what you were doing and they are to, to give us hope and a future in a relationship that's established in you. And so God, as we look through this, may we see the, the hope of Christmas and the celebration of the babe that, that is to come and that was Christ Jesus and may we see that fulfilled and celebrate that and may we also see this morning what he has come to do. And so we, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just help us to have eyes open, ears to hear, hearts to receive as we look at the work of this beautiful Savior, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you'll look at Isaiah 9, and in verse 6, it says this. You can read it on the screen or follow along in your Bible if you like. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You ever make a promise? I, I, I know growing up, like we used to do it all the time, and we'd be like, Mom, Dad, I, I promise I'll do my chores if I can just watch the next cartoon, like right after. Like Saturday mornings was cleaning a house at our house. You know, you had to clean and it. It never, met, it never mattered what was going on. They always seemed to get me right in the middle of cartoon watching time. That doesn't happen anymore, by the way. It's like, man, I miss that. But, you know, I was always in, engrossed. It's usually like the Scooby-Doo that was on. Like that's the one I waited for. Like I didn't care about the other lineup. It's like I'm waiting for Scooby-Doo. And it always seemed to be like as soon as that came on, Mom and dad would come in and be like, have you done your chores today? Have you cleaned? Have you made your bed? Have you, you know, I'm like, I promise, I promise I'll do it if you just let me have this. Thing. You know, we've done that, right? We've all made promises. Well, God makes promises too, but he doesn't do it the way we make promises. He makes promises ahead. Like he sees the beginning and the end. He sees all things. And he says, this is a promise I'm making to you, and it's one that will be fulfilled and you need this. This is something I'm promising you. And we saw last week is because he has a great love for humanity. And here, Isaiah talks about this promise of a son is to be born. For to us, a child is born. A son is given. There is one that is to come. Well, the promise really doesn't mean a whole lot if we don't have context. You know, if we, if we don't have something to, to put this in perspective, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So I want to really quickly kind of put this promise in perspective for us. And, and that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, God made a promise there. And he said that one would come from the woman, from the seed of the woman, 
who would come and crush the head of the serpent. And so what had happened in Genesis is Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, they were in the garden. Everything was perfect. The serpent deceived the man and the woman to fall into sin by eating the forbidden fruit. He, he tempted them. Now, as we look at it, we have to realize Adam was there the whole time too. It says that he was with her. He's watching the interactions. The serpent comes and tempts Eve and says, have you considered this fruit? God's God doesn't want you to eat it, but it'd be best if you did because you'll be like God. And, and she's considering all the things about the fruit and Adam is watching and he's hearing all this and she partakes of it and Adam sees that nothing immediately happened and so he takes it and he eats and they're both deceived. They both fall and he causes them, the serpent causes them to consider rebellion and they give in to temptation. Now the work of the serpent was to strike at the heart of God and to destroy humanity spiritually and physically as well. So his work is accomplished there. That's what he's going for. He wants, he wants you and I to be at odds with God. Why? Because we're created in his image. And Satan wanted to be God. He rebelled against God in the heavenlies and God threw him down to the earth. And, and so Satan in his anger and in his rebellion does not want us to have a relationship with God either. And so he comes and he tempts us and, and we all fall into sin. So through Adam and Eve, we all have sin nature. We are all dead spiritually. That's the consequence of that rebellion. So Satan's work there was accomplished of what he wanted to do, to strike back at the heart of God and to destroy humanity in the process. So God in Genesis 3, while acting righteously and passing judgment on mankind, also acts with unparalleled grace, and he gives the promise of one to come who will make everything right again, to put everything back, to, to restore what has been broken. That's, that's marvelous grace. He acts justly and says, I have to punish sin. Sin will be punished, but you know what? I will send one who will restore all things, who will make it new. And so one is to come through woman. And here in Isaiah, we see that Isaiah is talking about this child is born, a son is given. And we see that this isn't just any particular child, that this one is going to have the government upon his shoulders. So why are they looking for a Messiah king? Well, in 2 Samuel, the promise again is given uh, to Israel in chapter 7, verses 4 through 17. God specifies that one will come out of the line of David and he will be the king of who is eternal. He's the one who will reign eternally. And so they're looking for a king, a, a savior king. They're looking for one specifically from the line of David to come. And as we look at the Christmas story, if you've done any study, you'll, you'll know that Mary is of the line of David and Joseph is of the line of David as well. And so like through both of these two, Jesus is in the lineage of David fulfilling that promise of 2 Samuel but then Isaiah the prophet gives us this one. He says, one is, come, is coming, the government shall be on his shoulders. And then these titles come. Oh, he's not any particular child. He's a specific child. He's the son of God. He is wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. He is everlasting father. He is prince of peace. These are magnificent titles given to the one to come. I mean, think about it. Wonderful counselor. He is the one who will give counsel to his people to lead them in righteousness and lead them in truth. He is mighty God. His, he is the hero God, the one working in divine power, working in his reign, being one with the Father. Here it says he's also everlasting Father, the one who will always act fatherly towards his people. It's really interesting the way this is, is worded. The idea is here that, that the one who comes shepherds his people and acts fatherly over them, always blessing and working for their good and for their, uh, for their uh, growth spiritually. And, and so he is one mighty God, one with the Father, everlasting Father, as, a, as, a, as one who shepherds his people well, Prince of Peace. He is peace and will bring peace. He brings us peace with God, is what we see. This is a specific person to come. This is a specific babe who is to be born. This is a specific son that will be given. And he is 
fully man and fully divine. He is the Son of God, and these, these titles are magnificent to look at. Who can fulfill that? Who could fulfill that promise? Who could, who could carry that mantle? Not just any person. So this question I have is, well, what does his highest work look like then? So if this babe is to come, what's he to do? But if he's, if he's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and he's coming to restore, what does that look like? If the promise is that one is to come to bring us back and restore us, how does he do that? What, what does that look like? And that takes us over to Isaiah 53. Now, this isn't a typical Christmas passage, Isaiah 53. This is typically an Easter passage. But I think the two are so closely related that we really have to see them in the right context. Again, we celebrate Christmas because of what happens through the work of the Savior and because we, ha we have the promise of the resurrection at Easter. Like Without Easter, Christmas means nothing. It's, it's, a, it's a promise that wasn't fulfilled. But because Christ does this work in Isaiah 53, Christmas is all the more special. And so let's look at this. I'm going to read through it, and then I'm just going to bring out some things that he does. So Isaiah 53. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been, re or who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This chapter speaks of the death, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in this chapter, if, if uh, you follow any of the promised land ministries, a lot of times those working with the Jews, they call this chapter the forbidden chapter because it's not taught, uh, from what I understand, very, very regularly in the synagogues. Why? Because when you go to those who know the law and you just read 53 to them, Isaiah 53, and you say, who's that talking about? They say, oh, that's a New Testament passage talking about Jesus. And they say, no, this is from the Isaiah the prophet in the Old Testament talking about Jesus. It's, it's very easy to see that Jesus fulfills these promises at the cross, that he was put to death and condemned. And what is the point? That he has done a marvelous work to bring us back to God, to make 
and intercession for sinners. It says in verse 4 that he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. In verse 5, it says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity, for our sin. That's what that is. He, upon him was our chastisement. He was chastised for peace for us so that we would have peace. He was wounded for our healing. Verse 6, it says that he carried our iniquity. And he, in verse 7, that he was oppressed and he was afflicted. And this is for us. Verse 8 is where it talks about his death. He was cut off, stricken because of our transgression. Verse 12, it, it goes on to say, that because he poured out his soul to death, again, speaking of his death, he poured out his soul to death. He brought sin to an end, that punishment for sin to an end for the transgressors. He's, at the end of this passage, it says that he has made the intercession for us. That's what he did. This babe came, the Son of God was born, we celebrate Christmas, because he did this. He grew up, lived a perfect, sinless life, and went to the cross and did this for us. That's why Christmas is so beautiful. That's why when we sing these Christmas hymns that you hear on the radio, pay attention to verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, which, however many it has. Usually it's the first couple verses we, we all have memorized. And we have those in our mind. And we're like, oh, I love this Christmas song. I love this Christmas song. And they all celebrate the birth of Jesus. They all celebrate the baby. But they most often take a turn in verses 3, 4, and 5 and celebrate the work he did, the salvation that he brought, the justification that comes through his death and his resurrection, the hope and peace man have in Jesus because of this. This is, this is what this babe has come for. In Luke chapter 2, Verses 10 and 11 is the picture of the shepherds in the field and the angels appeared. And they say to the, to the shepherds, fear not. And they say, for this day. That's significant. For this day, a babe has been born for you in the city of David. What is so significant? He's saying the promise today is being fulfilled. He says it to the shepherds. He says, this day one has been born who fulfills this and wears this mantle, this title, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. He's saying this is the one that has come. This day he has been born. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23, it talks about this son is born and another title is given to him in this passage and his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. The babe is God with us, come to reconcile us back, to, to rescue us. What Satan did in the garden is being destroyed. That work is being crushed. He is crushing the serpent's head under his foot and bringing man back. The promises are being fulfilled. That's what, that's what this is all about. That's what Christmas is about, seeing this and rejoicing it, knowing that we have a God who loves us, who sent his son for us, and his, his promises were fulfilled. So let's look at Mark 15. This, it says on this day, Mark 15 is the crucifixion. I didn't give this slide to you. Thinking I should have, but anyway. Mark 15. It's, this is Jesus before Pilate. And Pilate says to him, are, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Yeah, I wear that mantle. That is who I am. I am the king. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? He stood silent like Isaiah said he would. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. It was the feast, and it was time to release a prisoner. So Pilate tries to release the prisoner, and he says, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? 
for he perceived that there was, for that it was out of envy that the priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd and had it stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with this man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released them Barabbas. And having uh, scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. That is the day. On this day, the atonement for sin was made. On this day, a babe is born. And on this day, atonement was made. And so the promises are fulfilled, we see. And so when Christ finished this work, the promise of God in Genesis 3 has now come all the way through and fulfilled. So now what? Luke 15, verses 20 through 24 so now what? What does this mean for us? Luke 15 is the passage of, or the parable of the prodigal son. And it says this, And he arose and came to his father. Now this is the prodigal. And it says when he came to his senses, right before that. What does that mean? It means he was living life like everyone else. And it was crazy. He was out of his mind. Because it says he came to his senses. He says, why am I living life this way? Why am I going after life like this? It's done nothing but bring me hardship and heartache and brokenness. And, and, and it's brought him to his ruin, the prodigal to his ruin, by living life wildly. And he says, I, I could go home. And so it says, so he comes to his senses. He actually becomes sane. Sees that there's a, a father at home who loves him and would care for him. And, and welcome back. So he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a long way off, now this is what I really want us to focus in on here. The father represents God. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Why did that babe come? Because we were a long way off and the father had compassion. He was waiting for us to come home. He was calling us home. He was giving us the promises. He was making a way. And it says, and he ran and embraced him. The father runs and embraces the son who was wayward and he kissed him and the son said to him father i have sinned against heaven and before you i am no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants bring quickly the best robe keep going is there more there <laughs> thank you and, and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The father does all that needs to be done by sending the son, and through the spirit convicting us of sin and righteousness, we come to our senses. We, we realize life, we're living it, as, as crazy people without God. And we come to our senses and we come back and the Father's waiting. But here's what happens. In our lives, we, we often say, you can never go back. You can't look back. You never can go back. Or we would say to ourselves, ah, oh, I burned that bridge. God won't, God won't be like this. He's not going to be waiting for me. I've burned that bridge. I've done too much. Or we say, you know, what's done is done. Just can't change it. It's in the past. But here's Here's what the Father says. He says, you can always return. That, that bridge you burned, I rebuilt that bridge. You can come home. I have fixed everything that you've broken. I've made a way. And he's waiting. And what does he do? He puts a robe on us, showing the provision that God has, the blessing that God has for those who, who repent and return. He restores us in, into the status of being sons and daughters. What Adam and Eve were before sin and rebellion he restores that relationship with mankind and he says i now i will put my blessings upon you he puts a robe on us he puts a ring on our fingers saying that we are his we are in his family we are under his authority we no longer are wandering around without a father we now have the heavenly father he puts a ring on our finger and says this one belongs to me and that's my authority that's my seal of authority 
that this one is mine. And he puts sandals on our feet. He gives us peace and hope. That those sandals, it's, it's the idea that we can go through life no matter what's going on. We have peace and hope. We can endure. We, we'll make it through. We have a Father who loves us and blesses us and gives good things to us and, and has restored us in relationship, who loves us deeply, and we have Him. We have that ring saying, I'm His and He is mine. So no matter what comes in life, I can have peace in it. I can walk through it. He will carry me through. He is with me. This is what He's, he's doing. This is what we see. And so Christmas is that calling us home. Is calling us back to Him, saying, come, be with me, come home, and let me bless you and love you. Let me be over you. Let me walk with you. Let me provide for you. Let me do all these things that sin has destroyed. Let me fix it and bring you back through Christ. And then it says here, the fatted calf is, is taken and, and slaughtered, and they celebrate. A parable before Jesus talks about the lost sheep, and He says, the shepherd goes and looks for the one that's lost and he brings it back and he says, in heaven, when one is brought back, when there's one who comes home, when the prodigal comes home and is restored in heaven, he says there's much rejoicing in, in front of the angels. It's not that the angels rejoice. He says in heaven there's much rejoicing among the angels. Like they see it, it's in front of them. They're, re, they're seeing a relationship restored that they don't have with God. We have a very unique standing with God that nothing else in creation has. And they see God celebrate in the heavenlies when a son or daughter return home and is saved. And here he's talking about the same thing. The father says, my son was gone. He was dead. He says, no, no, we're going to party. I'm going to put my robe on your back, a ring on your finger, shoes on your feet. We're going to get the fatted calf. We're going to slaughter it. We're going to rejoice. Listen, you think your Christmas celebration is off the hook? God's celebration in heaven is far greater than anything that we can imagine. He says there's great rejoicing, great celebration. God throws a huge party every time. Every time a sinner is reconciled to him. Every time one comes home. And that's what Christmas is about, that the babe came so we can go home. He does all that we cannot do so that we can be restored. So often, we, we, we kind of think, how does this work out in our day-to-day -day life? Like, okay, I know the Christmas story. I've heard it a lot. Even I, when I, I, I came to faith in college, but I knew the Christmas story. I was watching the Charlie Brown Christmas story on, on TV all the time. And you guys know what I'm talking about. You're waiting for it to come on, and, it, and there's the peanut special, and you got to watch the Charlie Brown Christmas story. And in it, you know, Linus gives that, that great speech of what Christmas really is about. And I've heard all of that. I grew up hearing about Christmas and Christmas traditions and, and peace on earth and all that. And then in the church, I got saved. I actually understood. I, I, I left my crazy life. I came to my senses. And I ran to God and he saved me. And I looked at Christmas. But as I keep getting years and years down the road, what's the, what's the issue? Well, it becomes familiar, doesn't it? I was like, what, is, what does the Christmas story really mean to me? Like, I heard this year in and year out. How does this affect my life now? What does this mean for me today? Like, I understand that, yeah, Pastor Rob, thank you for that great gospel presentation. I've been saved. What does Christmas really mean for me? Well, it means everything. It changes everything. We, we, we need to have our eyes uh, open to look at it with a, with a fresh perspective. We need to do that all the time. Here's what happens. It, the, the first way it applies is this, that salvation brings sanctification. In salvation, it's not just that he saves us, he transforms us. He makes us new. We, we become different. We don't walk in the old ways of life. We are transformed. We are different. We now have a heart of flesh and he has taken out that heart of stone and he has brought us to life. We talk differently. Oh, when I was a young man, uh, that expression, that guy swears like a sailor, that was me. I, I, I used vulgar language like commas in my sentences. Like, it was just a pause to get my thought before I get to the next thing. Like That's just the way I spoke. 
And that was normal. And that's normal to even today, talking to people in, in the world. That's just normal. It's just, but God changed that. In a moment, I said, God, I don't want to have this. You, you say in your word, I shouldn't be like this. Change that. He changed my, the way I talk. I, I, I was a very angry young man. If you know me, you probably don't believe that. You're probably, well, you, you seem really laid back and really even keel. I had one of those tempers like, like that. Like, just, psh, I'd go off. And I remember playing basketball, and I'm horrible at basketball. So if anybody wants to beat me at a sport, that's what you challenge me to, all right? I, I can pass a ball anywhere. I cannot shoot a hoop to save my life. If we're all in danger, they say, if Pastor Rob sinks a shot, you all live. Just make peace with God because you're not going to to live. I will miss that shot. And my neighbor was this gangly, skinny dude, you know, and he was like trips over his feet and stuff, and this guy could play basketball. And I, I kid you not, seven out of ten times he beat me, and that was so frustrating. And in a moment, I'm chucking the basketball at him, I'm cussing and swearing, I'm angry, and I stomp off at home, you know, and then five minutes later I come back and be like, hey man, you want to hang out? You know, I mean, that's just how I was. That was my turn. I just, God took that and changed that out of me. I became different. He, he showed me that anger doesn't bring the righteousness of God. Like, this needed to be transformed, and he transformed it. There was, there was as a young man, I had lust of the eyes, and I had issues uh, with lust, and, and God used uh, the Spirit to change my life and to remove that from me. I had desires that I was thinking of me first, and I wanted things to be my way, and I want... And God removed that. I had fear of what others think or say about me. I was always concerned. What do they think? What do they think? Is that okay? And, and that sometimes even still creeps up. You imagine standing up here week in, week out, and you wonder, I wonder what they think about my preaching, you know? And no, but God says, it doesn't matter. Just be faithful, Rob. And he takes that and he changes that. That fear of man, it goes away. That, that constant competing to be first or to be the best or... Or, or, or just constantly competing in this rat race, he's taken that away through the cross. He's transformed all of that. Now I can have peace and, and just live life. It's not a competition. It's just living with him. He's, he's changed us. What's Christmas have to do first is salvation brings sanctification. He changes us. We're transformed. We're made new. And the second thing is that sanctification then it's a display of the salvation that transforms a community. That we're walking differently, we're living differently. And that is something that people see on display. That is salvation on display, that God has done a great work, that you're not the way you were. It's always fun for me when I run into people from my past, because I don't go by Rob, I go by Kaz. And when I hear that, like the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because I know who Kaz was and he's not who Rob is. And those friends that see me from my past are like, oh, Kaz. I'm thinking, oh, you don't know me now. Like, that's the first thought I have is like, no, 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 don't, please don't call me that because that has, that's old connotation. That's the dead Rob. Like, this is new. I'm different. And, and there's that salvation on display they're like man you changed there's something different like you went into the ministry that that's my favorite you like you yeah god transformed my life and it's on display and that changes a community what does christmas have to do with the application here in somerset it is god's promise to transform a community as he transforms our lives as people come and are saved their lives are changed, and they live that out in front of others, they see salvation on display, and they can come and receive Jesus, and it changes a whole community. It changes a state. It changes a nation. It can change the world. That's what Christmas is about. That cycle of transformation begins. So it's not just the celebration of Jesus being born. It's the celebration of God sending the Son. It is the celebration of the Son saving sinners. It is the celebration of God changing lives. And it is the celebration of God changing our communities and changing the world. How's that for Christmas application? 
That's awesome. Let's pray together.